and mainly North Korea and Iran. And I think what you saw were a lot of countries responded. They were very positive to the speech. They appreciated how blunt and honest he was. I think that's been the overall theme from the international community this week is how straightforward he was and how refreshing it was as they heard him speak. Uh, we also um, today met with our allies, Japan and South Korea. Obviously a lot to talk about with North Korea and so we had good conversations with them and the president reassured obviously Japan and South Korea, but they also talked about strategies going forward for North Korea. On Iran, that was a, a topic of conversation throughout the week. I think everyone was talking about the destabilizing activities that they continue to do throughout the Middle East whether it's in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen, and the list goes on. So it is something that we will continue to talk about and continue to move forward to make sure that we're stopping any of their reckless behavior as well. Um, we also co-hosted a meeting with um, Secretary Boris Johnson as well as the Dutch Foreign Minister Bert Koenders on human rights reform and really talked about the fact that it needed to be representative of its name. We have a lot of bad actors on that council. Both the president and the vice president spoke about it in their speeches and the need to see um, better quality countries that are on that Council in order for it to be effective and obviously for the United States to stay on it. If we don't see changes in the Human Rights Council, we'll continue to advocate for human rights, but we'll do it on our own if we have to. And then the Vice President attended a Security Council meeting yesterday on peacekeeping reform. Uh, we have made great progress this um, past several months in terms of reforming peacekeeping so that it's actually going towards a political solution, it's transparent, it's accountable, but we're also giving the troops the equipment they need and the ability to have, be trained in order to do their jobs. And so we're just seeing smarter peacekeeping and I think that all came together in the peacekeeping reform vote that we had yesterday. Um, one of the topics that everyone had to talk about this week and all had an opinion on was Burma. And as we're dealing with the crisis in Burma and we're seeing how much migration has taken place from the Rohingyas going out of Burma, every country is concerned. They're concerned that um, the military continues to be aggressive and they're concerned that the government continues to be in denial. And so I think you'll continue to see the international community talk about that. I think you will only see them get more active on that as we go forward. And finally, today the Security Council took a great step forward. It was a measure that I think the international community have been working on a long time. We certainly worked with our British friends on it, and that was ISIS accountability in Iraq. If you look at the fact that there have been massive um, mass graves, there have been all types of um, terrible conducts to women and girls in those areas, um, whether it's what's happened with the Yazidis or the Christians or the Sunni and Shia Muslims, what we now have is um, a part of the UN body that's going to be able to go in there and actually collect evidence and make sure that it can be used in trial so that the victims finally have their say and get their day in court. So, um, or at least their families do if, they, if um, they've lost loved ones. So that was a big day for the Security Council today. And with that, there was obviously a lot more. I think the um, President met with multiple countries. There were lots of bilats. There was a lot of talk and, and planning and productivity. But overall, we can say it was a solid week at the UN this week, and it was highly successful. But with that, I'll answer any of your questions. Yes. Uh, Ambassador Haley. Haley. Thank you very much. Why do you expect this latest round of sanctions will work when an array of sanctions have failed in the past against North Korea? Is this in reference to what Secretary Mnuchin talked about? This is pretty amazing because when you look at the sanctions that we have in place, North Korea is already feeling it. You can already hear of the lines at the gas stations that they have and the fact that they are having a severe reduction in revenues is the sanctions are working. What this does is take it a step further. This says anyone that deals with North Korea, any financial institution that deals with North Korea is going to be um, punished. And so I think it's important. And it's like Secretary Mnuchin said, if you're going to support North Korea, then you have to be prepared to be sanctioned as well. And did you say that sanctions have been working and yet North Korea hasn't stopped nuclear provocation. Do you think that these sanctions are going to actually get North Korea innocent? We always knew that the sanctions may not work. What the goal of the sanctions was always intended to be is to cut the revenue so they could do less of their reckless behavior. If they don't have the funding 
for the ballistic missiles, for the nuclear production, then they can do less of it. That's the goal of the sanctions. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to change Kim's attitude or his belief on what he wants to do, but it will slow down the production the production of the nuclear process going forward. Yes. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Uh, when, when the president spoke in his speech about totally destroying North Korea if forced to defend ourselves or our allies, what, what exactly did he mean? Under what circumstances would he consider totally destroying North Korea? Well, I think that's just common sense. I mean, if you look at it, we have said multiple times, the president said it, um, members of his team have said it, we don't want war. That's the last thing anyone wants. We don't want loss of life. That's the last thing anyone wants. But at the same time, we're not going to run scared. If for any reason North Korea attacks the United States or our allies, the U.S. will respond, period. That's what's going to happen. What you're seeing now is we continue to go through diplomatic measures. We continue to exhaust everything we have. And the key right now is that other countries um, actually support the sanctions and follow through with them. And they also continue to isolate North Korea until we can get them to come to the negotiating table. But until then, that's just the reality. If they were to strike the United States, of course we would have to respond back. So, yes. Sir, just to clarify, if you, so you're specifically saying that that is if North Korea attacks first. I mean, we can't play out the scenarios on what's going to happen, but obviously it would take something very serious for the president to have to make a decision to do something back. But there's a lot of things between where we are now and that situation that can be done. There are a lot of military options that can be done. And so the president's not going to spell out specifically what he's going to do, when he's going to do it, or where he's going to do it. But there are many options that he's discussed with his national security team that should North Korea do anything irresponsible or reckless that he has to choose from. Ambassador, thank you. Um, just a quick one on the uh, sanctions on Korea, and then I have a um, question on Iran. On Korea, um, the administration has said that this is not aimed at China. But you heard the president say today that China has you know, told its central bank not to do business with North Korea. Secretary Mnuchin said that he called um, the Chinese. So how is this not, and especially you've talked about how China is really the main um, financial backer of North Korea. So how can this not really be directed at China? And then on on Iran, um, is there a way to talk about, to ramp up pressure as what you were talking about, Iran's destabilizing activities throughout the Middle East, which I think a lot of your allies agree on, without violating the agreement, per se, as Secretary Tillerson said? I mean, is there a way to get allies to rally around more uh, terrorism type and other sanctions while keeping the, um, you know, nuclear provisions in, in uh, place? So first of all, with the sanctions on North Korea, it only impacts those that continue to do business with North Korea. So if China does business with North Korea, yes, it will impact them. If there are countries in Africa that do business with North Korea, it's going to impact them. So really it depends on countries that choose to continue to support North Korea over the rest of the world that's asking them not to. In reference to Iran, you have a couple of processes that take place. On October 15th, the president uh, has the decision to make on whether to certify or decertify. And that's U.S. law. That has nothing to do with the JCPOA or the Iran deal. That's U.S. law. And U.S. law requires the president every 90 days to decide whether the Iran deal and other um, elements of the U.N. resolution um, which would include ballistic missile testing, which would include arms smuggling, which would include support of terrorism. Those things, it asks the president to look at all of those things. And if he still thinks that the deal is in the best interests of the United States, then he certifies. If he thinks that the deal is, um, that the situation is not in the best interests of um, the American public, then he doesn't certi certi certify. At that point, it goes to Congress. And he works with Congress on how to reshape the situation. But the Iran deal and U.S. law are two different things. You're saying that he could um, decertify without specifically withdrawing from the deal. That's right. I mean, that's just the option that he has. And that's the Corker Cardin law that came into effect that allowed that to happen. What I will tell you from a U.N. perspective, what we're looking at and what you're going to hear us very vocal on is the fact that um, 2331, the resolution that was in place, what we saw 
um, was it basically wrapped in with the nuclear deal. It said if Iran did any of these things, it would be in violation. And since then, the Secretary General has come out with a report that said they have violated all of those things, their support for terrorism, their arms smuggling, the idea that they continue to do ballistic missile testing, and they need to be called out for that. And that's something that you will see us do as we go forward in the United Nations to make sure that they know that just because we did this nuclear deal, it doesn't give them a pass on all the other things that they're doing wrong. Yes.